Welcome to the course of PHSSS EC 02M, which is the Physics ACC course. In this class, we'll be talking about learning scientific C++ hands-on. So, in this lecture, what we are trying to complete is basically based on the course objective. which has been assigned by the university and based on the course objective the learning objective is to understand the importance of programming to understand what is scientific programming what are control statements we learn programming in c++ or any of the scientific languages from scratch and at the end we'll be learning what is visualization and how to achieve it using any of the scientific softwares the software in question which we'll be using is called as genieplot so this is the complete course learning objective that we'll be following now the according to the syllabus the c++ hands on syllabus primarily states that we have to complete certain assignments during the entire course of the acc and these assignments are basically divided into two parts and the first part is those which involve programming using a programming language for example c++ and visualization using some visualization software such as gnu plot so in this case we have classified those programs which have to be done using a programming software and as you can see that the numbers 1 2 3 4 5 9 10 10 and 11 are the questions which involve programming using c++ and among those programs we will be trying to use those programs as a tool to introduce the concept of c++ programming in order to introduce the entire lecture which is the first lecture of this series this one hour lecture does not intend to teach you c++ programming from a newbie to a guru rather it intends to address the assignments set as the pivot around the model solutions to the problem set and tries to explain the structure of c++ programming the side by side approach which has been developed by tlc iit bombay is recommended in which the video should be run side by side to the terminal which you will be using to do your programs the video may be paused or rewound at any instance where you want to type in or compile your code so with this introduction let's start with today's lecture plan this is a lecture 1 and today's lecture plan in this class we will be basically will learn about the nuances of c++ programming through two sample problems and these two sample codes the first code will be the sum of a finite series and through this we will be able to find the sum of the squares of numbers ranging from 1 to 100 as you can see over here and we we'll print the sum and in the second problem or the second program which we will be using over here would be we we'll take multiplication of two 3 by 3 matrices and in that we will take input from the user and what we will be doing is basically taking those inputs we'll be doing the calculation or the product and finally we'll print the output for the user to visualize so let's begin by doing some stretch exercises 
for our hand and then we can sit with the computer to do the rest of the programming. One of the important things which we must understand is that we should get started by doing it hands-on. So according to Walt Disney, he had said, the way to get started is to quit talking and begin doing. So let's start with the hands-on approach to the entire problem. So the first problem that we have talked about is called as to evaluate the sum of a finite series. Here we learn the basics of the C++ program structure. So let's look at the program structure over here. So we can see that this which we see on the left hand side or on your right is basically the program which is the sum of a finite series. Now you might think that when you are writing the program you have to emulate what has been done by the teacher during the class. But that is not the correct method of doing or learning programming. Programming is like an art as well as a science. So what you must understand is that you may write a code in a different way. But the inherent structure must remain the same. So let's understand the inherent structure that is inbuilt inside the code. So we are using the program which we, the program 1 which we had talked about as the sum of the finite series as an example using which we learn the different nuances of C++ programming. So the first thing that we learn in a C++ program is the first two lines of the code which basically is called as the header. So now the question comes, what is a header? Now header over there, we can see, starts with a hash. Hash include iostream.h. If you look into the software structure of a C++ compiler, you will find that there are different directories or folders, which you call in Windows, under which different files are stored. Some of the files have got an extension .h. Such files are called as header files. And these header files exist at the beginning of a particular program. We can see over here that this iostream.h is a header file over here I denote it just as iostream which can be found inside the directory or folder called include. Hash is considered to be a pre-compiler statement. What is the meaning of a pre-compiler statement? A pre-compiler statement is compiled before the execution of a particular program. So before the C++ compiler starts compiling, then the header files are the first to be read by the system. And as you, if you can refer to what is called as cppreference.com, you can see that there is a lot many of header files which are listed over there. So we can use each of those header files as a linking to the various uh, commands that we will be using throughout my programming. In case of this program, we'll be using just one header file called as the IO stream, where the I stands for the input, O stands for the output, and stream stands for the transfer of data from the terminal to the machine. So this is basically what is meant 
by the header file. So now let's go to the next part of our discussion, which is the next line of the program, which says using namespace dot std. You see, as we have seen that IO in case of header files stood for input output. Similarly, std stands for standard. So namespace is basically a space where all the naming conventions have been mentioned. Now since there might be multiple naming conventions which are allowed by C++ and many of these naming conventions could be built by the user himself, hence we have to mention them using what we see on the right. What we see that we have to then specially mention using std colon colon string semicolon using std colon colon c out using std colon colon c in as you can see that so many prefixes of std is basically a typographical uh, an entire difficulty for the programmer to type so many times std colon colon. So in order to remove that, what basically using namespace.std does is it basically reduced the amount of typing used for common commands which we will be using throughout the program like c out, c in and endl. Now in this case, let's understand the stepwise functional approach to C++. You see, C++ is a language which is based on C. And as the C language had been developed, it was developed based on mathematics. And in mathematics, the languages could be very well enclosed using what we know as a function. So over here what we have is called as a functional approach to C++. So where do we get the functional approach? So if you look at the fourth line of the main program which I mention over here as one, we can see that the main function is the primary function inside which the entire program has been structured. And if we look at this function, we see that it starts at line number 5 and it ends at the line number 11, which are both enclosed within braces, which is the second bracket. So inside that, the entire main function is enclosed. So main is the only function that works and is compulsory in case of C++ program. So main is called as the default function and is a must for a C++ program. The second point which we must remember is that we have to, as we see in the point number two, we have to understand that there are certain things which are called as variables. Variables are references to some allocation of space in the memory of the computer. So these variables, for example, over here we have used i, n and sum. These variables are of a particular type of data. And these have to be declared using what is called as type declaration. So the type of data over here as we can see is of a data type called int. And this int stands for integers. So the numbers which we can allocate to the variables i, n and sum are restricted only to the category of integers. 
What happens over here is that we can also declare it in terms of different types of variables. For example, the data types could be, which are allowed in C++, could be of the types fruit, which denotes primarily real numbers. Then we can have a data type called cat, which denotes character variables. Then we might have boom, which stands for boolean type of variables. We might also have strings, which are string variables. Then, what we have in the step number three is what is called as n is equal to 100 is called as initialization and sum equal to zero is also called as initialization. Initialization is a very special type of declaration statement. In such a statement, what we do is we assign a particular numerical value to a variable. When we assign this numerical value for the very first time, it is termed as initialization. The values that are given to a variable, for example, i is equal to 1 in line number 7, we see that that is the initialization of i. Whereas, when I am reassigning the values inside the for loop that i is less than n and i++, plus plus, that is called as assignment and reassignment. For the first time, if you do it, it is called as initialization. If you do it for the second time, it is called as assignment. And if you go on doing it over and over again, then it is called as iteration. Now we talk about variables and reassignment. In this section, we will be seeing how the reassignment of values of variables are done inside the sum in line number 8 of the program or step number 4 where we see sum plus equal to i star i. In that, what we are doing is that the old sum value is getting added with the i square term, that is i star i, to give it a new value or a reassigned value for the sum. So, this process is called as reassignment. When the same variable is assigned a different or a new value after a line of compilation, for example, the step number 4, then that is called as reassemble. The printing of the values we can see over here is done in the step number 5, where we use C out. And instead of C out, we were, would have been forced to write STD out if we had not used the second statement which was using the C out which we use over here. Basically, we had to write STD colon colon C out. However, we do not need to write that because we have already defined the std to be the namespace throughout this program in the very second line. We have written over there using namespace std. And so because of that, we don't need to write over here std colon colon cout. Instead, we just write cout. And then we give the arrows towards the C out direction, which shows that all the things which are written within the double quotes will be printed as it is into the output stream. And then if when we write the, the two arrows after which we write sum, 
then what this would do in the step number 5 is that the numerical value of sum is going to be printed out into the output stream using the cout command. In the last part, in the line number 10, we see in the step number 6, we basically complete or return a value from the function. We know that whenever there is a function, we give some values. In case of main, there was no values which were given because it was a blank parenthesis. However, the output we assume in such case would be 0 or a null output. Let's see over here. It is return 0 in the step 6. So, we give it a null output. So, what happens is that return is a compulsory activity which we need to do as long as we have maintain the functional structure of the C++ programming. Now let's go to the next program. In this program, we'll be learning to multiply two user-defined 3 by 3 matrices. As we know that our first program was pretty easy because we were interested in just finding the sum of the we were interested in finding the sum of the squares of 100 numbers. And as we can see over here, the sum of the 100 numbers were printed in the output. And we can see over here the seconds which it takes for such a calculation, which comes to be 1.051 seconds for this particular calculation. Now let's see that if we go for a scientific programming, a more scientific complicated program, how much of a time delay we are going to get in the particular type of program. This is what we try to learn in this case of scientific programming. So now we will be applying the knowledge which we have learned in the last example to do the programming in case of a real mathematical program. Let's see how we go about this. On the left hand side we can see, on my left hand side you can see that this is the program for the, uh, the multiplication of uh, two 3 by 3 matrices using C++. And if you look at this program, you can see that it is basically a, a program of 47 lines. And out of that, there are spaces uh, which uh, make your program look much better and is much easily readable for the, uh, for the user. But we must understand that scientific programming, because the topic of this was scientific C++, so scientific programming is basically unable to do something which is a mathematical calculation or a scientific calculation with the help of computers. So over here, uh, one of the principal things of doing C++ programming is to understand how we can use C++ to do matrix mathematics. And in our case, we take a very simple code of matrix multiplication. So C++ coding can be used to do matrix calculations. The data structure which we use are called as arrays. As we had stated at the beginning of the class that we would be using the different, the two programs to also introduce you to the various nuances of C++ and like that, the next step is to introduce you to a new data type, which is called as arrays. So let's understand what an array variable is. There are two types of array variables which we have over here. 
they could be array variables which are arranged in a column wise fashion and there might be array variables which are arranged in a row wise fashion in our particular case we would be dealing with c++ array variables these array variables will be dealing with one dimensional array and two dimensional array in our particular example since we are dealing with a 3 by 3 matrix we will be basically dealing with only a two dimensional array in an early example in the uh, the exercise which is given in number 1 of the problem in this you would be requiring a 1d array to do that problem of mean median and mode so let's consider this two dimensional array as you can see over here we have written over here a new type of variable in step number 1 where a33 is written so this a33 b33 and c33 are three types of variables which are categorized as array variables and these array variables are such variables which are able to store numbers in contiguous spaces in the memory so these memory allocations which we see over here these allocations basically happens for nine allocations for 3 3 so when i write a 3 3 nine spaces of memory is allocated by the computer similarly for the float b 3 3 and c 3 3 we allocate nine and nine spaces for this particular variable b and c respectively so as we can see that we have defined this particular variable a and we have done a type declaration of the a as int while the type declaration for b is done as float this is primarily to show that basically what is the data type which will populate this particular class of variable or type of variable a in case of a the variables which we populated would be of the data type integers while that of b and c are of data type float the values that would fill them up would be of the float data type or real data type now we understand that these float data and the real data which we are dealing with would be allocating different amount of space in the memory for example in case of an integer if 8 bits of data is allocated then for a real number we would be allocating double the amount of space if we use double instead of float we would be allocating four places of data or four bytes of data of memory space for this particular type of variables so each of the type declaration also allocates a certain amount of space for that particular variable in the computer hard disk or memory now the question comes is that how can we populate these variables into the memory allocated the earlier slide so we had seen in the earlier slide that we have allocated a certain memory space for this particular type of variable and how many bytes of data could be put over there has defined by the type integer similarly we have also allocated a certain area of memory space using b and similarly for c now the question comes is that both a and b has to be user inputted now the question comes how can we Populate these data 
as user input. In our case, since it's a two-dimensional array, as we have used a three by three matrix, hence we have to create over here two loops, as you can see in the upper picture. But in the two loops, we have got step one and step two, where we have two for loops in tandem, which are running from zero to two. So it basically runs three times. So similarly, J would run from zero to two, that is J less than three. So that would again run three times. So that basically the I and the J traverses the entire length of my matrix, which is a three by three matrix. Then we can say that I might denote the row and the J might denote the column variable of this particular matrix. So what happens is that we need to give the user a queue, a, a notation where the user understands what exactly is expected of him to give as an input. So in order to do that, in the line number 8, we use C out, enter the matrix A with an ENDL which ends the line. So it would basically, the cursor would move to the next line. And in that, for each of the values, for example, C out A, I plus 1, that basically gives me which is the value of I and which is the value of J for which I want that particular input from the user. This would be much more clear in the next slide where we would be looking at the output, how it looks from the user side. Now let's understand the programmer's point of view. What happens for the programmer is that programmer gives a queue in the step number three. In the step number three, the user gives out in the using C out a particular prompt giving the value of I J. And in the fourth step, what it takes back from the user is basically the input that the user has typed in inside the using the keyboard. So that now see in, look at the arrows, the arrows is going inwards towards the variable A. So AIJ now gets populated with the value of C in which is the user keyed in value. So whatever value has been keyed in by the user is now getting stored in A I J. Now remember the I has a numerical value. It will start from 0. For the very first loop, it will go for A 0 0. For the second one, it will go to A 0 1 since J loop is inside interior loop. I is the exterior loop. So like this, it will go from 0, 1 up to, it will go start from 0, 0, it will go to 0, 1, it will go up to 0, 2. And then my I value will iterate by one step up to 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2. And then it would again, this loop would end, the interior loop would end, and then it would go to step number one, where the I iterates up to I would become now equal to two. The first will be now equal to A, two zero, two one, two two, and then this entire step ends. So total number of inputs that you will be getting would be nine in number. So similar to that, we can see over here, we can see for the input of the B, where we say that C out enter the matrix B uh, end line. So that gives the first what is the 
uh, which matrix is the user going to input the automatically the user understands which matrix he is expected to input and then this prompt will give him the value of the b row column of the or the b index of the input and that would again be inputted inside the bij so looking at that we can see that both of these are used as input statements with certain structuring the end line over here acts as the end el so what end i would do it would take the cursor to the next line and what would happen in this one is we have got also a critical statement over here which we denote by this one and this one step is critical because inside this loop we are actually punctuating two things as one the second job which we had was to initialize the c matrix to be equal to 0 and that initialization is done inside this step 1 where we write cij equal to 0 and using this step we are able to get this entire system working as an unison means if we go to the now the 29th step onwards we would be requiring a step which incorporates the entire calculation of cij where the initial cij needs to be done and this initialization of cij is already done in my earlier slide which we can see in the earlier slide we have already initialized the cij matrix to equal to 0 so let's understand how or why is scientific programming different from normal programming why scientific programming is different from normal programming of c++ it is primarily because we are learning to use our imagination to structure an entire programming architecture into a particular problem solving mode over here we use the inherent structure of array for our programming yet the inherent array structure becomes immaterial for my programming calculation whether my array structure was in a row wise or in a column wise structure it is not pertinent for a particular mode of discussion in this case of scientific programming so we are more interested in solving the numerical problem we don't have to delve into the internal mechanism which the compiler works in that is the importance of scientific programming so let's understand what is the theory behind matrix multiplication before we look into the c++ application of it let us assume that we have an a which is an n cross n matrix in our case it's very simple it's a 3 by 3 matrix n is equal to n is equal to 3 however let's imagine that there is another b matrix which is n cross p matrix now we know that such a product is only possible when the number of columns of the first matrix must match with the number of rows of the second matrix we see over here n cross n so the number of columns over here is n and b over here has n 
cross P. So the number of rows of the second matrix is N. So since they match, such a multiplication is possible. The next question which comes is that when we are looking at the matrix product AB, in that calculation, what would be the entire matrix or how can we go for the calculation of the entire matrix? Up to class 11 and 12, we have learned that we have to multiply this uh, row with this column and continue this process over and over again. However, once we go into the BSC level, we must understand that this could be very simply written in terms of a particular formula. So the formula stands like Cij is equal to Ai1B1J, Ai2B2J, dot dot dot, Ainbnj, which could be very well summarized as summation over of k is equal to 1 to n of a i k into b k j. So when we look at my i and my j, my i would run from 1 to n and my j would run from 1 to p. However, the things are not that complicated in our case because we are dealing with a very square matrix which is 3 cross 3. Hence, we now just emphasize on the outcome or the formula which we get from this. And this formula, if we want to write that, it is basically Cij, look at the equation step number 4, Cij plus equal to, that gives you be the summation, over of Aik star Bkj. So this is basically a mathematical formula which we are converting into a formula in computation. And this is what is called as scientific computing. So in scientific computing, we are using this equation as a formula. Now the question which comes into our mind is that where is the summation k is equal to 1 to n. So we can see over here for k is equal to 0 to k less than 3. So that basically means my k would run from 0 to 2. So this automatically gives us that this will be the inner summation between the a, I, K and B, K, J. So once we have got that, we get the value of C, I, J. Now I need the value of the C, I, J for this entire matrix. This matrix comprises of C11 to C, N, P. So then what do I require? I require the step number 1 and step number 2, which would concurrently run this over this entire matrix for all the values of i and j. So this would then, this line would primarily give me the entire values of the matrix C. Now let's look at the user interface. So what I stated in my earlier portion is that it would be difficult for me to explain how the things look like until and unless I show you how the outputs are going to be. Now let's look at the output. When I, we look at the output, we can see over here that I have used for the particular, in particular the case of B, C out, enter the matrix B, end line. So how will it, will it look in the output? We can see over here, it writes enter the matrix B and this goes back to the next line. So end line primarily will take the cursor back to the next line. And what happens is that 
in each of the a we can see it goes from 1 1 and it gives a q it asks for the user to give a particular input so once the user has given 3 over there and pressed enter the next a would be generated as the q for what is the next index that you need to input so basically this entire structure of this particular inputting primarily gives the user the cue as to what is the value that the user needs to give to the program for it to run so what happens is that when we input the value of 3 over there, this value of 3 gets stored inside the particular variable that is given by the C in. So similarly, when we go for the next one, it goes through C in for the next ij value which corresponds to 1, 3. In this case, 2, 1. In the next case, 2, 2 in the next case, 2, 3 in the next case, so on and so forth. So the this loop primarily what it does is it increases the value of i, hence storing the value of the user input to the next and the next consecutive memory allocated space given or denoted by the variable a in this case and b in this case. What happens in this is that C out enter prints the output on the screen and NL is the new line character. C in stores the user input variables to the particular variable name which I am assigning to it. So as a summary, let's understand what are the things that we have learned today. The first thing that we have learned today is that we have learned what is a header. Header is primarily a file which is a precompiler statement. It is denoted by a hash and these headers always exist at the start of a C++ code. What is a namespace? The namespace, as we have learned, is primarily a shortcut which reduces the number of times we have to type which namespace I am using. The namespace could be a standard one or it could be a non-standard user created one also. In the functional approach to programming, we have learned that C++ is based on C. C is based on the mathematical theory of functions. And in a function, we know that we could write a function as f of x and after that we give two braces to show how the function operates inside that particular brace or inside that particular interval. So that function within the parenthesis fx, the x is the user input value which the function takes from the user and the value whatever it returns comes from within the braces which is the second bracket. So return primarily is the call which returns the value as the output of that particular function. In the next part, we have learned about variables and type declarations. We have stated that there are different types of data that could be allocated in C++. For example, we have talked about integer, 
type of variable, floating type of variable, boolean type of variable, character type of variable, and string type of variable. We could also have derived variables, for example, long, which is which stands for long integer, which allocates double the space of the space allocated by an integer. For example, we could have double, which allocates double the space of what is allocated for a float. We could have a string variable, which could be very long, or we could allocate a simple ASCII character for the cat variable. We could allocate true or false or zero or one for a boolean type of variable. The type of the variable has to be declared in front of the program before we start using the variable. The variable type declaration could be done inside the program while running the program also. However, it is considered to be a good practice to always declare the variables at the top such that we do not miss out on any variable that we are using later. Assignment and reassignment. Assignment is primarily the concept where we give a value to a particular variable. Remember, a variable can only be assigned a particular value that is congruent with the type declaration. So, if we have declared the type declaration of a particular variable i to be an integer, if we use a floating i is equal to 2.1, then the C++ is going to summarily truncate the values after the decimal point. So, uh, uh, whatever value of i I have taken, it will be truncated to 2 instead of 2.1. For the very first time, when I am giving some value to a variable, for example, in our case sum, when I am sum is equal to 0, it is called as initialization because we are doing it for the very first time. So, there it is called as initialization. However, the same variable could be assigned a different value and could be it's the, same, it's the same variable could be given different value during the loop. Such assigning of the value recurrently is called as reassignment. So, the same variable on the sum could be written sum equal to sum plus i, where supposedly sum on the left hand side is the new value of the sum, the sum in the middle is the old value of the sum and sum plus i will be the new value of the sum called as reassigning of the old sum by the new sum. So, such a statement is called as a reassignment of variable. Then we have learned in the second example that there we could use arrays as a data type. So, we have stated that arrays are basically contiguous allocation of space. The allocation of space could be column wise or could be row wise based on the nature of the compiler. For example, in case of Fortran, the entire allocation of space is done in a column wise fashion. For example, in case of C, the allocation of space is done in a row wise fashion. In case of scientific programming, we had stressed that this sort of allocation mechanism does not play a part in the outcome of the program. That is the advantage of scientific programming. 
The next is that scientific programming involves imagining of a physical or a mathematical structure in terms of a computational uh, memory structure. For example, like arrays. In our case, we have made a one-to-one -one correspondence between a memory allocated in the array to a matrix element. In the last part, we have talked about user input and output and in case of user input and output, we have shown that a user who is at the end interface of a program has to be given certain cues. Without the cue, the user does not understand what he or she is expected to give to the program as an input. So the programmer must be careful to give certain cues such that the user can input correct values in those particular queues such that the program could continue to run and finally it could end. In order to have the output, we have certain commands which are called as C out, C in and end L. C out basically uh, is a command which forms under the namespace called standard. So we have to give the header and the namespace at the top without which the C out function, the C in function or the end line function will not work. So header and namespace primarily defines how the C++ is going to respond to this particular command. I hope you all have understood what we have studied in today's class. If you have any problem regarding the questions, please go back. You can rewind the video to the section where I have discussed that and you can go through the coding and please try to work the coding yourself such that you will be able to do the programs without the video itself. Thank you all.